unmuted. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Jay Papazan. I want to thank everybody for their patience. I wanted to come on and chat with y'all. For whatever reason, um, Lewis is, we're trying to dial him in. We are working it out. So I'm going to go ahead and start. I've got Ian on my team. He is reaching out to Lewis, and we are going to get him on by the, his scheduled appointment on the show, which will be in about five or six minutes. So again, thank you for our patience. We really value your time, and um, we definitely want to make sure that this is a great use of the hour that you've given us. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us. Um, we had over 1,400 people sign up for this, and there's you know, 500 or so on the call already, and more are coming on. So thank you for being here. Um, real quick overview of how this is going to work. We, um, I will really quickly um, introduce our guest speaker, which today is going to be Lewis Howes. He has just launched a book yesterday called The School of Greatness, which is named after his podcast, which if you haven't listened to it, I've been subscribing for almost a year. It's every time I listen to it, I learn something new. It's a great, great investment of time, and it's one of my daily habits. So I hope you guys will check that out as well. But his book is a compilation of the things he's learned on his journey and from all the amazing people he's gotten to interview on that podcast. And in particular, we're going to dive in on some habits that today will lead you towards greatness, which is in keeping with his book. So one of the things I'll remind you throughout, we have the questions bar. Um, if you look on your dashboard, there's a questions bar at the end of this, about 40 minutes into it. We're going to open it up for questions from you, the audience. So if you want, just type a question in and let us show show us that you can use the questions bar. I was going to say, who's going to win the World Series, the New York Mets or the Kansas City Royals? If you'll just type your best guess or I don't care, let us know that you can use, oh, boom, Mets are showing up fast and here come the Royals. Great. So it's easy to use. During, the, during our talk, if you have a question, please type it in. <laughs> Padres, the Padres aren't even in there. Love it. Lots of Mets and Royals fans on this call and lots of I don't knows and I don't cares. So that's great. Um, so after we talk, we'll open it up to Q&A. So type in your questions and we'll start perusing those as we go. Um, before we get to Lewis, we know that roughly three out of 10 people who join us on this monthly webinar series isn't familiar with the one thing. Um, so we usually take just a couple of minutes and we remind people what exactly it's all about, right? Because it's the one thing for cultivating greatness with Lewis. He's joined us. So I'm going to quickly integrate these ideas so that you know kind of if I'm talking about a domino run, you'll know where it's coming from. And without further ado, we'll bring on Lewis Howes at that point. So first off, if you just had to sum up the book, you really had to get down to the brass tacks. It's about the 80-20 rule, right? There's a guy named Vilfredo Pareto back in Italy who recognized, you know, he was looking at wealth in Italy, that 80% of all the land was owned by only 20% of the people. You know, that idea got written down and recorded in like 1860s, and it really was hidden until a guy named Joseph Duran picked it up in the 1920s. And Joseph Duran was a, what has become one of the most famous quality control guys ever. He saw that and was like, wow, that's not just about economics. That's about everything. You know, I do assembly lines and, you know, 80 percent of the flaws come from 20 percent of the defects. And so he wrote about it and called it Pareto's principle um, in his definitive book. And it's since caught on and spurred a whole bunch of books. What we want you to do is not only look for what's the 20 percent that gives me the 80 percent of my results. Right. But what would be the one percent? What would be the one thing? If I can only do one thing that would give me the most results, we want to focus you even further, right? So boom, right there, you understand we're looking for leverage, leveraged action in our lives. The promise of that is what we call a domino progression, right? Everybody on this webinar hopefully has lined up dominoes at one point in your life. The idea there is if you line things up properly, doing one thing can actually do many things. Right? It's an acknowledgement by Gary and I, the authors, that we do have a lot of things on our plate. There's just no escaping that. It's a modern world. We have lots of opportunities and obligations. But if we focus on the right thing, we can actually get a lot of things to happen. And so just as a point of reference, the world record is actually almost 4.5 million dominoes. A group in the Netherlands lined that many up and by doing one thing, got almost 4.5 million dominoes to fall over in order kind of amazing. 
And then we started looking a little further with our researchers, and there was a, a guy named Lorne Whitehead, and he wrote an article in the American Journal of Physics. And he discovered that a two-inch domino can knock over a three-inch domino, and a three-inch domino can knock over a four-and-a-half-inch domino, and so on. And he actually built them out of wood, and by the 10th domino, the domino was as large as a, a six-foot-five man, you know, basically Peyton Manning. So he said, what began with a gentle tick ended with a loud slam. And our aha was, not only can one thing do many if you really organize it, it can do more. And the scale of that is really astounding. If you were to keep lining up those dominoes, by the 18th domino, that two inch domino growing at 50% each time would knock over the Tower of Pisa. By the 23rd, it would be taller than the Eiffel Tower. And just as a point of reference, I was just speaking about this book in San Francisco. The Eiffel Tower is actually 200 feet above the Transamerica building. It's huge, it's over a thousand feet tall. I had no idea it was even that big. By the 31st domino, starting with a two inch domino, this geometric progression would grow so large, you could knock over a domino 3000 feet taller than Everest. And just 57 dominoes into the run, it would reach almost all the way from the earth to the moon. Now, I just want you to pause really quickly and reflect on the shape of that graph. Researchers call that the hockey stick, right? Because it looks like a hockey stick on its side. And anything that grows at a steady progression, like any sort of like, you know, you think about compound interest, it'll do the same thing. What happens is it'll take on the shape. What looks like it's too slow to notice becomes so big you can hardly get your mind around it. And in our research, in our observation, that's kind of the shape of big success that what you build as a foundation over time becomes more and more powerful, a lot of times without you really paying attention. And I'm kind of hitting this point hard because I think it really resonates not only with our speaker today and his message, but with the idea of habits, because this was a big focal point and a big takeaway for us. If you could identify your one thing, the thing that, that matters most, and in the, the parlance of our book, the one thing such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and necessary. And you start doing that day in and day out. Well, over time, you'll become a master at that and you'll get more and more impact from it. So one of the big principles in the book was if you knew your one thing, wouldn't you just want to make it a habit? Wouldn't you want to work for the habit so that that habit would start to work for you? And one of the kind of startling things that it was, it was new knowledge to me. One of the startling things that we discovered was boom, if you can work for something on average for a period of time, almost all the effort goes away. So this is one study that we found out of Australia. They asked a lot of graduate students to take on a new health habit. Anything from drinking eight glasses of water a day all the way to, you know, like quitting smoking. And they followed them around for a year asking two questions. Did you do it? And how hard was it? And as you can see on your screen here, by the time they got to day 66, on average, most people were all the way through the power curve. Almost all of the effort had gone away. And so in our book, we say that somewhere around there is kind of where the habit forms. And I've heard lots of other principles, 21 days, 28 days, 31 days. Um, I'm playing it safe. And we advocated, you know, even though those numbers and we saw the stats, it might work. It may be that you need to keep going. The best possible practice is if you really think this is your one thing and you want it to be a habit, that you just do it until it gets as easy as it's going to go. So that's the big prelude. That's why habits, it is absolutely central to our theory, right, of what we're trying to accomplish. And that's what we're gonna talk about today with our guest. So really quickly, a lot of you here are on the call because of Lewis House, but I'm gonna read you a little bit from his bio and then we're going to have him on the call. And we're, we are absolutely, um, you know, using duct tape and wiring to kind of make this work. I'm going to have him on speakerphone by my speaker. And we're going to try to make this work as absolutely as best we can. But Lewis Howes, lifestyle entrepreneur, runs one of the best podcasts out there, as I've told you. He just published a book yesterday called The School of Greatness. And I looked this morning. It was already number one in every business category. And quite amazingly, for a book that just come out, already number 28 overall on Amazon. So this is gonna be a big book. You're gonna see it everywhere you go. Um, it's published by Rodale and it's just gonna, it's really gonna make an impact. I really believe that. He's a former professional football player. 
Um, he's a two sport All American in college. Um, even though his bio doesn't say this, his book does. He actually set the record for the most receiving yards, the world record for the most receiving guards in, in a college football game. He's accomplished a lot. And today he's on the U.S. men's national handball team. Um, he's been recognized in the White House and by President Obama as the top, one of the top 100 entrepreneurs in the country under 30. And he's also a contributing writer for Entrepreneur and Yahoo. That's, I mean, I could go on and on. This guy has done a lot really fast. He clearly understands and gets going for greatness. And I think he has a lot to share. So without further ado, Lewis, can you hear me? Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I really am excited to share your message with everybody here. Up oh, here we go. One more time. Say that one more time. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I'm going to move the volume up and there we go. Well, Lewis, um, thank you for joining us. And really quickly, I, I have to ask always, where did the idea come for writing a book? I've written a few of them. It's a lot of hard work. What inspired you to write this book? Yeah. Well, before I get, before I get into that, thanks for, for making this work where well, with all, all the technicalities going on right now, so hopefully you guys can hear me okay, and I'll be speaking loud and clear. Uh, just let me know if I need to adjust anything. I, with this book, I'll tell you what, Jay, eight years ago I had a dream, and I think I mentioned to you this before. I had a dream when I was on my sister's couch. It was Christmas of 2007, going into 2008. If my math corrects me, I believe that's eight years ago. I, I got a book. It was the only gift I got for Christmas, and it was a book. It was called The Four-Hour Work Week. And I remember at the end of this book, I read it in three days. I remember thinking to myself, wow, I didn't know entrepreneurship was possible. I didn't know how to make money. I didn't know you could build a business or a brand. I had just got off playing a professional football, and I was so focused on my vision of being a pro athlete that I didn't. I didn't study to learn about business or anything else in life because I was so committed to my vision. When I read this book, it opened me up. It was the catalyst for possibilities. It opened me up to a new world that I didn't even know was available for me at the time. And then for the last eight years, I've been following through on a vision I had that day after I read the book. I read the book. I put it down. and I said, one day I'm going to create a book that creates this inspiration in in the minds of millions of people around the world, the way this book has inspired me over the last few days and inspired me to get, to get started, to get moving, to get through the transition phase that I was in because I had just lost my identity. I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I needed something to cling on to, to take action towards. So this is really an eight year journey. Um, I didn't know how long it was going to take me, but it's, it's been incredible because I knew I had to get enough results in my life, in my business, uh, build the relationships before a book like this could come out for me to get the results I wanted to with this book. So I had to become the human being that I needed to be in order to have this message resonate with enough people so that the book could spread the way it's already been spreading in the first day. It's been unbelievable, the response. <laughs> It's okay. number 20, like you said, it's, it's gotten low as number 27 on Amazon. It's number five on Barnes & Noble right now. It's number one in every category, like you said. Everyone is coming out of the woodworks to promote. My goal is that you open up your phone, your TV, your email, your Internet, and you see the book everywhere. And it's been amazing to see the responses, and I'm so very grateful and blessed so far. Well, I remember when I um... – I love that story. I love where you've come from in your journey and how you share it in the book. You know, the, one of the things that you shared with me and, and part of the mission here for you, because when I got a chance to be on your show, we talked about purpose and life mission. Yes. You have a huge vision for helping people in this world. Can, can you share that with folks? Like, I mean, because it's a pretty extraordinary vision. Yeah. You know, my vision has shifted over the years. When I was uh, in high school, I wanted to be a collegiate athlete and get a scholarship. When I was in college, I wanted to be a pro athlete. When I was on my sister's couch recovering after an injury, I just wanted to get my own apartment and make enough money every month to get my own apartment. And so over the years, my vision has evolved and it shifts and it changes. And sometimes we have a dream or a vision that we pursue and then we aren't as excited about it anymore, so we stop. So these are things that are all okay. It's part of the seasons of life that you talk about, Jay. Mm -hmm. And 
for me, I'm in a transition right now where I realized a few years ago when I started this podcast, when I was, I sold a company, I was in a transition. I was like, what do I want to do now? Like I was 28, 29 years old. And I was like, okay, what's next for me? Like, what's my next transition? And I said, I want to make a bigger impact in the world before the last, in my twenties, it was really all about making more money and getting some achievements and being, I don't know, recognized and received well by people and building those relationships. And I did a lot of that. I, I went and did all those things. And I said, you know what, maybe it's something when you hit 30, I don't know what it is. But when I hit 30, I was like, I feel like I need to make a bigger impact in the world and, and come from a place of service as opposed to how can I get my needs met? But I think I needed to make sure that my needs were met early on. Uh, so that I could feel like my basic needs were covered. So I just decided when I started doing this podcast and when people really resonated with it and would email me long messages about how it was changing their life, I said, I want to impact a hundred million people and show them how to make a full-time living doing what they love. Okay. I was teaching people how to build business online and, and, and through the process of me doing it. And I was helping a lot of people through coaching and, and online stuff about uh, how to get to that next step in online business. And I was seeing how people were lighting up when they were making money doing the things that they love doing the most. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's no better feeling to say, I get to wake up and then go do those cool, fun things every single day that I love doing, where I get to interact with people and talk about it and be it and experience it. And I get paid for it as well. Is this real life? Like that's, it's, an amazing feeling when we get to do the things that make our heart sing and get paid for it. I believe that what that's what makes us feel the most fulfilled, the most loved, the most worthy of ourselves. And we treat others with respect, more respect. We take care of our health better when we're that fulfilled. And that's been my mission right now. My vision is to create information, content, resources, uh, videos, whatever it may be to teach people how to follow their dreams and make money around that. Well, I love, I love that Lewis. And I love the size of it because when you first said a hundred million, it just came out of your mouth with such conviction. <laughs> it wasn't bravado. It wasn't being cocky. It just sounded like this is my mission. I'm going to impact not just any number, but a hundred million lives. And so awesome. I love that. And today, hopefully we can provide some real inspiration for some folks to start creating some, real positive changes in their lives. So I'm gonna ask you one more question. I'm gonna transition slide wise to kind of the big ideas of your book and where I'd love to drive in on habits since that overlaps so well with the one thing. But I've gotta say, and I may have missed it. I, don't, I haven't listened to every single one of your podcasts. Huh. But your signature question, you know, you ask people, what's your definition of greatness? Is this book kind of your answer to that question? Mm, that's great, I, I like that question. Uh, I would say this book, I mean, I have a one sentence answer if you want to hear that, but I would say that this book is my definition of greatness. If you can go through and follow, there's eight principles in the book that showcase what the greatest individuals, minds, influencers, scientists do to reach the top of their game, not just financially, but impact wise as well and connection wise. And I believe if you can master these eight principles, you're going to have a pretty incredible life. I love it. And I've got that up on the screen. I know that because of our technical difficulties, you're flying a little blind, but I've got the eight good. areas of focus from your book up and we've highlighted positive habits because yes. I felt like when we talked about getting together to share your message, that was an intersection point with the one thing because it's a huge area of focus for us. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, positive habits specifically. I mean, here's the thing. We have, there's so much happening in our day to day life. And I know you talk about this in the one thing, but there's so much happening in our day-to-day -day life that we need to set ourselves up to win as much as possible in order to lead our lives with, uh, with our visions as opposed to just accepting what comes to us every single day, accepting the jobs we have, accepting the life we're living. And the habits, that first hour for me is very important. The first hour in the morning, the, the last hour at night, those are two important hours of, of positive habits that we can include because most people that I, that I hear from, they just get up and start going about their day. Right. And there's no, in, there's no intention for what they're creating that day. 
And the richest people in the world, the most successful people in the world, they do it differently. They get up earlier. They have some type of morning ritual routine where they're usually reading. They're doing something healthy for themselves. They're doing a workout. They're doing something active to get the blood flowing. They're stretching. They're meditating. People have different things that they do. But for me, that first hour is so important to at least do something to set the intention for what you're creating the day, as opposed to just let me wake up and get my kids up and eat and make sure I brush my teeth and like react constantly and try to catch up. Instead, why don't we create a game plan for ourselves every single day of what we're creating based on our vision Yeah. and based, based on our vision, then we decide to say yes or no to certain things throughout the day. And we take action towards the, the most important things than everything else can wait until we complete those most important things. And for me, that first hour or however long in the morning you need to, to set those habits in motion are so important. And whenever I follow my morning ritual, I, I just know my day is going to be way better. I'm going to react less to people or situations. I'm going to be calmer. I'm going to be more intentional. I'm going to be clearer about what I want. When I don't follow my morning habits, when I just get up and kind of just like roll out of bed and, and, and kind of lazy with my intentions, I get lazy results. And it's your foundation, it's really right? I mean, it's really What's your found, it's the foundation of your day. It is. It is. And it's, uh, it, it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, but it's, it's so worth it and important. And when you commit to something that you say, okay, I'm going to do this for a month. Uh, I'm going to try this for a month, this habit, this new thing. And you give yourself an hour of different habits. For me, it's a 12 minute meditation. It's a workout. It's a green juice and a smoothie and it's making my bed and then expressing gratitude for the day. For me, those five things are a must. I have other things that I'll add in there if I've got more time, but it's like, I got to start with gratitude, setting my attention for the day, making my bed, having a green juice or smoothie, and then doing a workout. If I do that every morning, I'm going to feel unstoppable and I'm going to be a much better human being throughout the day less reactive and angry or resentful towards the situations that come up. All right. Can I, can I, can I dive in on a few of those? Um, yes. I, I laughed out loud when you read, um, when I read the section about making your bed because, <laughs> it, well, it's such a small thing and I kept hearing it. It was so funny. I kept hearing it. I heard Noah Kagan talk. He's an Austinite. He was talking about it. I heard, you know, uh, Tim Ferriss saying, you know, he'd started making his bed. And I'm like, what is all this about making your bed? And yeah. then, strangely enough, I remembered someone referenced the McRaven, General McRaven, giving the commencement speech at UT right here in Austin. Yep. yep. I've watched that with my kids like five times. Like my kid, mm -hmm. my son, Gus, knows all about you know, making your bed and I think you call them sugar cookies when they had to lay in the sand and, and you know, you yeah. know, roll around in the cold. But it made such an impression on me. And I, I had just sent a book to him because of that video. And I was like, wow, my whole world is coming back to this make your bed thing. And I made an internal decision like I'm going to add that to my habits in the morning. And I look up and the bed's already made because my wife got ahead of me, Wendy, and she started making our bed for the same reason. So right. wh where did that idea, did it come from McRaven? And, and what do you get from that simple act? You know, I remember seeing that video, when was that a few years ago, that commencement video, but I, someone else, I gave a talk at a thing called Mastermind Talks. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. Mastermind Talks. Yeah. And there was a, a, like a Buddhist monk, I forget his name, who gave a presentation. And the whole thing was about making your bed, essentially, from what I remember this talk. And he said, go back and send me a photo of it. You know, that was like his call to action. It was like, tomorrow, go make your bed and then tweet me a photo of it. <laughs> and I remember, this was like three years ago probably. And I remember I never made my bed. And I'll, and I'll admit, I I feel bad to say this. I had I hired an assistant about three years ago. And she would like, you know, she was doing a lot for me at the time. She would cook my meals, which she still does. It's incredible. But she was also kind of like cleaning the room and making my bed. Uh, if I didn't make it or if I just kind of sloppily put it together. And I was like, that's when I realized like, okay, I, if I can't make my own bed, like what is wrong with me? You know, this is something my mom has been telling me to do since I was a <laughs> child. I should be at least doing one thing on my own that I have ownership in. 
And the bed for me, it's like, since I started doing this a few years ago, the bed is like the sacred space that I didn't even realize the value of it. But when I get in my bed at night and it's been made and it's like perfectly crisp and I get in there, I feel different than when it's messy or when it's sloppy getting in there. I just feel at ease when I go to sleep. And sleep is one of the most important things for us to have energy and uh, recover and all these different things that we need to, to live our dreams. But I wasn't thinking about it really. So when I, when I make my bed in the morning, it does a couple of things for me. One, uh, I don't know if I got this from his talk or not, or from the, uh, the, the guy on uh, the commencement talk or not, but I, I feel momentum. It's like I complete uh-huh. a task. And the first thing I do is I complete something and I feel like I feel positive esteem in myself. I've, I've built my self esteem. It's like, okay, I'm getting something done and I've cleared the energy and cleared the space. For me, it's really important to be clear and clean throughout my day and or, let's say organize because otherwise I'm going to have an unorganized mind if I have an unorganized life. So that, that is it, absolutely, I think some of the essence of it for me personally too. And I think general McRaven had said the exact same thing that you begin your day by accomplishing something well. And even if your whole day is horrible, you come back to your bed and you, you can say, good. <laughs> I got one thing done and it was well, and I've never heard anyone say, and it also sets you up with this, and I agree. I totally, it feels different getting into a bed that's been made with crisp sheets than the other way around. Um, something else you said in there is the like, feeling. just, you said my mom used to make me. And I think the reason so many of us don't do it and don't appreciate it, probably, it feels like yeah. something we get to grow out of and we don't have yeah. to do anymore versus something that we get to do. And it's a pleasure that we get to enjoy. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, listen, you know, not every day that I'm like excited to do it because I've got my mind is racing sometimes if I don't do my, my morning ritual, but it's almost 99% of the time when I get out of my room, my bed is made now and it's rare. Maybe on like a Sunday morning, if I'm just kind of getting up and going to watch football out in the living room or something, I'll, you know, I won't do it sometimes, but I find it's such a huge difference maker when I do it and I highly recommend people doing it. Well, it's it's incredible. All right. Well, you know, we got about 10, 15 minutes before we open it up to questions. So I'm just going to remind everyone, if you're listening to this and you have a question, um, even if it's just about making your bed, type it in the question so that we can get to it um, at the end of this broadcast and answer your specific questions. I, I had a, something I was going to ask you in general. Like I look at this, these eight areas and I, I love that positive practice, positive habits is one of them. When did you first become aware that you needed to be purposeful about habits? Was there a moment where this really clicked for you? I mean, back in high school, I would say, actually maybe eighth grade, I went to a private boarding school and that's when I really understood the power of discipline mm-hmm. you know, in, in, my, in my life. And discipline, because we, we had to have our room look a certain way, we had to wear, we had a dress code, we, you know, there was mandatory study hours, uh, there was, there's all these things that was like, it was very disciplined and even in sports, you know, it was very rigorous and disciplined you know, everything had an itinerary where there was an itinerary for practice. There was an itinerary for school. There was an itinerary for the morning itinerary for, uh, after you get back from dinner without being in your, in your room to study. So everything had a purpose and an intention. And I was able to be so much more focused with my life when I had this itinerary as opposed to just what am I going to do today? And maybe I'll create something, maybe I won't, and we'll see how it goes. So I learned early on in eighth grade and through high school, I was still in this private boarding school. And I thrived off the discipline. I thrived off the coaching, off of the structure, because I was able to create incredible results in that structure as opposed to just loosey goosey, do what you want structure. And I followed that through in college sports and and, and pro sports. And then after that, when I started building my business, I realized I need to have an itinerary for what I want to create every single day so that I can schedule it and then make the time for it and make it important. And then everything else doesn't matter towards my vision or it can wait if it's not as important as my vision during these set hours. And that's really guided me to, to where I'm at right now. That's cool. Well, really quickly, your morning rituals, will you recap those for us? 
Um, yes. This is the ideal, the ideal morning. Your itinerary. Again, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not a perfect human being, so some mornings I don't do it. But um, I wake up and I express my gratitude first thing because I live another day and I'm healthy. And for me, if we're not expressing gratitude, then we are. I just feel like there's so much to be grateful for in the world, and when we come from a place of I'm blessed, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what our situation is, where we're struggling, like we're still blessed to be alive and to have the opportunity of this life. So I come from gratitude first. I love that. You then, you, you can't have a yep. pity party and be grateful at the same time. So no, exactly. You absolutely yeah. are going to jar that thinking right out of your head. So that's number one. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. What's number yeah, two? Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah. It's hard to be angry and, and grateful at the same time. Yeah. So if you're ever feeling frustrated or great uh, or stressed out or, anxious, write down a list of things that you're really grateful for because it's really hard to be both at the same time. Love it. Um, so I start with that. Then I do a 12, it's like a 12 and a half, 13 minute meditation. That is just a guided visualization that I've been doing for over a decade now since I was in college. I did it in sports. I actually started doing this about a month prior to breaking the world record that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there must be something onto this thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just kind of stuck with it and it's been a powerful same kind of meditation. This is nothing like crazy or anything. It's like a, a, a yogi that just walks you through like what you want to create in the day and walks you through your, your, your breathing and things like that. So it's just kind of getting clear, grounded on my breath and focusing on my body and what I want to do today in the world. I do that. And then I make my bed. I get out of bed and make my bed then and then I go for a workout. I, I like to go run or I go lift. It's, I mix it up every single day, but I do something that's uncomfortable. I think it's really important in my mind from an athlete's point of view, it's really important to experience some type of discomfort and pain every single day, preferably in the morning. Now, this doesn't mean you have to kill yourself and do the hardest workout of your life every single day. But what it means is you've got to feel really uncomfortable. So running three and a half miles for me is uncomfortable because I can push myself as hard as I want in those three and a half miles and my lungs will burn and my legs will burn and it sucks and I want to stop. But I think it's so important to build the pain threshold for our bodies so that our mind continues to get stronger and grows as well. And that's why I think it's important for you to do something every single day. This could be just doing uh, air squats to failure or push-ups to failure. Something where you're like, man, that really sucks and I don't want to do that. But this doesn't have to be a whole hour thing. It could just be like some type of thing with your body where you're sweating and you're uncomfortable. I love that. Uh, and I've never yep. heard it put quite that way. And that's a, a very unique angle. Like everybody thinks, oh, this is about health. It's about energy. Yeah. But my mentor, my co-author, Gary, always says, you know, if you really want to be successful in life, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And you have almost yeah. those exact words in your book. And this is a habit that's as much about health. But you're also, I mean, as someone who's trying to strive for their best, just getting used to running into barriers and pushing all the way through them. And that's so cool. Yeah, yeah I think it's important to create moments every single day of you know, planned stress because the bigger our goals and dreams and our businesses or, uh, in our life, there's going to be stress that happens no matter what. There's going to be adversity, mm -hmm. challenges, uncertainty. And if we're not preparing ourselves every day, it's like a daily practice for the bigger games that come up all the time. If we're not preparing ourselves, then how are we going to expect to just show up and be able to handle situations when the most pressure is on the table, when we're trying to close the deal, when we're doing the job interview, when we're uh, speaking in front of 10,000 people, how are we supposed to have any experience if we're not practicing it on a daily basis? So for me, it's important for your health, absolutely, probably first and foremost, but it's also important to build that muscle of being able to take on any adversity that comes your way. Love it. And so, and then there was two more. So you have gratitude, meditation, workout. Oh dream, yeah, I'm sorry. Dream. Uh, so then I, I, so gratitude, meditation, make my bed, make workout. Then I come back and do a, some type of stretching and intention for the day. Okay. A stretch. I like to stretch and recover 
intention for the day. At the same time, I'm drinking my green juice or having a smoothie. It's kind of like all in that same time. Um, and that's the, that's it. And then there's a shower, you know, the whole bathroom routine routine where I'm just cleaning myself and brushing my teeth, that getting dressed and then going into my vision for what I'm creating that day. What I love about that is you can pretty much do that anywhere. You know, yeah. you, you can run three and a half miles, even when you're traveling, you can do everything that you just described. Maybe the green juice is something you have to go buy if you're in a hotel somewhere, right. but pretty much everything else, there's no excuse, you know, unless you decide I got to take a day off. Everything is our habits that you can implement all the time. Exactly. I love it. Well, really quickly, you said something that I'd kind of forgotten about from that book. You don't just have morning rituals, and that's what a lot of people, and that's where we focused in our book. You also have evening rituals. Do you want to give us just a, yeah. a real high flyover of if you launch your days with such purpose and intention, mm -hmm. how do you finish your day so that you really are, are set up for the next day? Yeah. I think it's important to, to close the day with uh, – with gratitude and peace and closure as well. So at the end of the day, I, I like to unwind for about 30 minutes before I go to sleep and follow this process. And that's either, it's depending on where I'm at in my life. Right now I'm not in a relationship. When I was, uh, you know, last year, every night before bed, I would call my girlfriend and, and ask her what are three things she's most grateful for? Hmm. Cause I want to know the day, what are the three things that she, can express gratitude for it. Cause again, no matter what happened, the struggle, the pain, the frustration of the day, when we focus on gratitude, it's hard to be angry. Got it. And so I want to, I don't want to go to bed angry. I want to go to bed saying, wow, I'm blessed. I'm grateful. This is an incredible life, even through the struggle and the journey. So I asked the question to someone at night, what are they most grateful for? Three things. Then I'll reply with my three things for the day. I, turn the phone off and, and, and what I've been doing lately is putting it on the other side of the room. You know, if, if I was, you know, really stepping my game up to the next level, I would put it like on the other side of my, my condo and in the kitchen yeah. and ha have it over there. That's like next level habit, which I don't have that skill yet. Um, but I put it on the other side of the room, it's on silent. So I'm not touching it and I can't reach it. I think if it's in your reach, you're screwed. So put it somewhere. You, it's not in your reach. But I have my, I use it as my alarm still, so that's why I have it. Um, and then I close out like anything left in the day I need to, to close out. Like where is my mind thinking? Is it still racing? What do I need to write down to say, okay, I'm going to get to that tomorrow as opposed to just being in my mind and thinking about it when I sleep. I try to get everything down I need to. I try to get clear with everything, any type of relationship issue try to clear it or write it down the feelings I'm having so I can deal with it the next day and handle it the next day. But it's important for me to, uh, to go to bed being clear and putting everything down that I need to before I go to bed. That is really cool. All right. Well, I've got us about 15 minutes to the hour. So before I open it up, I, I see some really cool questions that are coming up now um, that I definitely want you to have chance to at least to kind of rapid fire some answers, but if you were going to share with this audience, and a lot of them are entrepreneurs, um, a lot of them, like specifically, we have a lot of folks who work in the health industries, um, a lot of folks that work in finance and real estate. Um, a lot of them are independent contractors. They're self-employed. Um, if they could start with one habit, if you were going to recommend, where would you say for them to focus? Hmm. One habit if you're an entrepreneur or self-employed, and what's your goal? Yeah. Yeah. What would be one habit you would recommend? I mean, it could be drinking green juice if that's what you think mm. will just get everybody would, going. Yeah. I would say the most important thing every day, I mean, green juice is huge for me. It transformed my life when I started it four and a half years ago. But I would say the most important thing is our bodies and that's being active. So some type of physical pain every single day. I'm not talking again about killing yourself, but some type of physical discomfort with a workout every single day that is going to do so much for your mind, your body, your heart It's going to be healthier and stronger. And it's going to release a lot of stress and tension. But if there was only one thing I would say being physically active with discomfort every day. Love it. And I, and I love your twist on the health um, and the, the discomfort. That's really, um, that's my big aha um, from interacting with you today in the book. 
So I'm going to quickly go to some of these questions. Um, we've got about you know 14 minutes before the end of the hour, um, and I want to reward some folks for a lot of patience. So the first one's going to be from Nick, um, and I love this because I'm curious too. He says, "What are Lewis's three truths?" He always asks people on his podcast. I love this question. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> someone I had my book launch party last night in New York, and two days prior, I was like, "I wonder if someone's going to ask me this question, and I'm not going to be prepared." So I answered the guy last night, and let's see if I can remember what I said. But I'm going to say what my three truths are in this moment, sure, or what I'm thinking at. My three truths are um, always come from love. Okay. The second thing would be relationships matter, and we're here to connect. So make the most of relationships. And the third thing would be your dreams are the most important thing in the world. Make sure to follow them. I love it. Those are really powerful. And I thank you for being game. And I just put you on the spot. Um, but it's all good. I put everyone else on the spot. So I guess I deserve it. Right. <laughs> um, all right. So here's a good one. Uh, this is a little, it's one, one of your other uh, topics there, but D ask, can you give an example of turning adversity to advantage or like lack of money or startup or advertising for a business person? Yeah. I mean, can you give an example of myself or just an example? In general, and, and, like yeah. from your, from the people you've interviewed or the research that you've done, what's a good example for you know, a business person turning, you know, disadvantage adversity to advantage? Man, well, I'll give an example of, of myself. If that's sure. okay. From, you know, when I was broke and I was struggling, trying to figure it out, I was, I realized that one thing really made the difference for me to get to where I'm at as opposed to staying in that situation. And that was taking the, the feedback and the advice from coaches and mentors. So I remember feeling like, okay, if I have this dream where I want to write a book and I want to be able to speak on stage and I want to be able to build a business online, I was trying to do it on my own early on and it wasn't working. I wasn't getting any results. And so all I did was reach out to people who were doing what I wanted to do. And I would take them out to coffee or just somehow get in front of them and then listen very intently to everything they would give me feedback on. I would say, here's what I want to achieve. What would you do if you're in my situation? And then they would tell me exactly what they would do. From that, I took a lot of action. All I did was just listen to very successful people and do what they told me to do. And that's it. I think a lot of people try to do it on their own or they're too afraid to take certain actions because it's not perfect looking or it doesn't look right or they're afraid of what people are going to think or I didn't care. I was just like, I don't care what anyone says about me or what it looks like. I know it's not going to be perfect, but I am committed to this vision. So I'm going to listen to these mentors and coaches. And I think that's for me, I hire coaches in all areas of my life, not that. because I don't not because I don't trust my own instincts or because I don't think I'm smart enough, but because I want to see where my blind spots are that I may not be seeing every single day. And I want to just have the feedback that's like, okay, I'm on the path. Like what's, where can I, where can I improve? Where can I get better? Where am I maybe messing up? And just have that refinement. And I think when so many people try to do it on their own and business specifically, it's like, unless you've been there and already done it, how do you expect to create it without the support of someone else guiding you? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people, we have people here for a reason. We should use each other as resources and support as opposed to trying to do it all on our own. That's cool. I love that. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, it's funny. I was just laughing. There's um, more than a handful of people that are happy that you're single now, but the, the most interesting <laughs> answer is, um, I won't say her name just because I don't, I'm sure she wants that. But, you know, a lot of people, she's really happy that you said that. A lot of people see you successful and people sometimes feel like because they're single that they're not being successful. So I just wanted to share that with positive feedback yeah. um, and not maybe the usual kind you get. Um, sure. Here's, Thanks. Here's a, a nice question from Jamie and she wrote a very long message and it's very hard felt. What would you tell someone, I'm just going to paraphrase, that was struggling to identify their dream? 
you know, it's 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 create a vision. It's like the very beginning of this process, and they're they're struggling to figure out what their dream should be. What advice yeah. would you give them? It's interesting because a lot of people came up to me last night at the the launch party and were saying similar things, and I said. Well, I'm glad you came to get this book because that's what it's here to do to help guide you through that process. But what I would say is two things that you can start to do. And one would be to ask a few of your close friends and family and say, ask them these questions. When do you see me with the most joy in my life? What am I doing? Who am I spending time with? What am I talking about? Uh, where am I traveling to? When do you see me with the most joy in my life? That would be the first thing. The second thing would be to take a moment, and I talk about this in the book, at the end of the first chapter on vision, the next exercise I talk about, which is your perfect day exercise. Yeah. I would say take, take a moment to go in nature with no phone, no electronics, no one else around, and sit there for 30 to 60 minutes and dream about if you could have anything in your life, if if you would not feel guilty about having it, there'd be no shame associated to it. If you wouldn't be disappointing anyone, what would you be doing in a perfect day for you? Would you be traveling? Would you be goofing off at the beach? Would you be, uh, you know, with certain people, what would you be doing? What would you be chasing? What really excites you when you think about that you couldn't fail and that everyone would be supporting you and that you wouldn't feel bad if you did it. Because I think a lot of times we feel bad about our dreams. We feel guilty, like our parents didn't want us to do those things, or that's not what our spouse wants us to do, or they won't love us if we don't if we don't do what they want us to do. And for me, that's just BS. You know, we're born to pursue and live our dreams for us to inspire other people around us to do the same for themselves. We're not born to live other people's lives that they want us to live. We're unique individuals. So what I would say is do those two things. Ask some friends what make, brings me the most joy. When, when I'm doing what, where do I have the most joy? Um, and then go into nature and write down what a perfect day could look like for you. Write it down. Think about it where there's no guilt, no shame involved. Just so you can see for yourself, oh, okay, cool. Here's some of the things that I enjoy doing. Now we can work on getting to the next steps so you can make money around doing those things. Love it. All right, I think we've got time for at least one more question, and I want everybody to stay on. Um, and we're going to make a very special offer um, for everybody who, if they'll commit to picking up Lewis's book and emailing us the receipt at greatness at the one thing dot com, um, the first hundred and fifty receipts that we get um, over the next week, we're going to give you a free pass for an upcoming um, online course that we're building on how to time block better on the one thing. That's going to be worth about $500. So I'm going to give you the full details here in just a second, but I want to, there's three questions in this vein. Um, Shahid um, has asked, you know, how do I stop procrastinating? This is one of my biggest challenges. And then Malcolm writes what to me I find connected. And if this might be two questions and I apologize if it is, but why do so many of us know what to do, um, but then don't do it? How can we change? And to me, I kind of, I connect those questions, but you know, how do we stop yeah. procrastinating? How do we do, do the things that we need to do? You know, we all work differently. So some of us are very self-disciplined and motivated and other of us need to support. So what I would say is, again, always find ways to set yourself up to win and doing it on your own is hard to do over time. We can start it, we can we can get it kick started on our own, we can be committed and have this willpower, but I think you talk about willpower in your book as well. It's hard to sustain that for years, uh, you know, doing it all on your own. So what I would say, set yourself up to win, find an accountability partner, find a relationship you're in, you know, be in a relationship that supports your your vision and can keep you on task, hire a coach, find a mentor, find a team of people around you that you've got to stay committed to, um, to keep you on task. Join a company that has a powerful, inspiring team that's going to inspire and motivate you and keep you consistent. Any of these things will work, but if you try to do it on your own, it's going to be harder work to do. Cool. All right. I, I lied. I'm going to ask you one more question because I just see now yes. as I scanned, a lot of people asked us to repeat 
what was the specific meditation that you follow in the morning? Is there a way that they could look it up? Is there a name of it that you can remember? Uh, it's interesting. I have an, it, it's like an audio I have from 10 or 12 years ago. So I don't even think it's available online. It's just, uh, something that my sister gave me huh. from her yoga, her yoga teacher. So, okay. Yeah. It's not, maybe that's something it's like a that one you of can... a kind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to recreate it on my own yeah. and, and kind of update it for today. So I'm going to be posting that out here sometime in the next probably. 30 days once this book launches. Cool. You know, well, if you let me know, time, I'll so. make sure I email everyone on our mailing list to that, so that, that everybody will get the answer. Okay, Perfect. folks. Um, Lewis, first, before I kind of wrap things up and, and give people the details on how they can get the, the free course um, in exchange for investing, which I think is the best thing they could do in this book, thank you for sharing your valuable time. I'm so honored that you would give yeah. us an hour the day after your book launched, and I know exactly how crazy and exciting that is. Um, I'm happy and excited for you. I know this is the beginning of a very big journey and you're going to go a long way towards helping a hundred million people with this new platform to speak from. So congratulations and thank you really from the bottom of my heart for sharing your time with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. I appreciate it. Cool, man. Well, everybody, thank you again um, to all of the folks who joined us today um, for listening in. I want to really quickly um, on the screen uh, we have a link. So go to the one thing.com slash Lewis house, follow it. It just takes you to Amazon, buy a copy of the school of greatness. The first 150 people to email us their receipt right at greatness at the one thing.com. They will get an invitation to an upcoming online course. Um, Gary and I are developing a class on how to time block better. We pull and you know, we pulled 36,000 people and 47% of you said that was your number one challenge. So that's what we're going to attack first, time blocking and battling distractions. Um, it's going to retail for $4.99. So the first 120 people get that for free, and they're going to get it in exchange for investing in themselves. This is a great book. I read it in three sittings, um, and I'm a super impatient reader because I read so much. So I really am confident that you'll enjoy this book. Um, on exiting the survey, we hope that you'll take 30 seconds and just answer the questions. It really helps us shape these and make them better for you. And a lot of folks have asked, if you didn't get a chance, you came on late or you had to leave early, we are gonna email everyone the recording for this webinar and you'll it'll be posted online at the one thing slash webinars. The link is on there. Our next webinar um, is with Peter Vucht. He is a amazing entrepreneur. He's done incredible things like Lewis very early in life. I'm super excited to share cool entrepreneurial tricks with you there. Um, that's it, folks. Thank you for being patient with us this morning when we had a, a little bit of a technical, um, you know, two-step to get us going. Um, I'll, I'll post pictures of how we had to jury rig this on our blog. It's actually kind of hilarious, but it, it sounds like it, nobody complained about not being able to hear Lewis, so we were successful, and I'm happy you, we could share him with you today. So until next month, thank you so much for joining us on The One Thing. Um, you can find us online. Um, there's my handle, there's Lewis's, um, and there's the one thing.com. And if we left a question unanswered, we'll try to answer it there. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next month.